And Gosler is a stress test. And what it's shown is a West that is racist, however you want to define the term. The point is, what was occurring to the Gazans occurred to you was inflicted on any Europeans, you wouldn't get this, not this blase response, but this complicity. We are, in legal terms, you know, accomplices before, during the fact. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I've got with me again, Michael Brenner. Michael is a professor emeritus of international affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and a fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at John Hopkins. He recently published an essay entitled The West's Reckoning, the link is below, in which he argues that the two defeats, the one in mili the military defeat of the West in Ukraine and the moral defeat of the West in Gaza will have devastating consequences for the collective West. Uh, we want to discuss this today, so thank you, Michael, for coming online again. It's a pleasure be, to be with you, Pascal, uh, once again. I look forward to it. So, I really loved your piece. I just enjoyed reading it, and I would like to discuss it. So, um, let me read the, the introductory paragraph, uh, because I sure. think it's very powerful. Western leaders are experiencing two stunning events, defeat in Ukraine and genocide in Palestine. The first is humiliating, the other shameful. Yet they feel no humiliation or shame. Their actions show vividly that those sentiments are alien to them, unable to penetrate the entrenched barriers of dogma, arrogance and deep-seated insecurities. The last are personal as well as political. Therein lies a puzzle. For as a consequence, the West has set itself on a path of collective suicide. Moral suicide in Gaza, diplomatic suicide, the foundations laid in Europe, the Middle East and across Eurasia economic suicide, the dollar-based global financial system jeopardized Europe de-industrializing. It's not a pretty picture. Astoundingly, this self-destruction is occurring in the absence of any major trauma, external or internal. Therein lies a related puzzle. Let's talk about the first puzzle first. Um, why has the West set itself on this path of collective suicide? That, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, that, of course, is the the big question. And as I said, the most puzzling question, because I think any sort of standard explanations which are rooted, which would be rooted in our historical experience, um, simply are, are not sufficient, if and if indeed they're they're adequate adequate at all. Uh, I think um, it's impossible to understand. I think this phenomenon, unless we place it in the context of some rather unfortunate developments in the public life of Western societies generally which manifest themselves in a, a degrading of political life, public debate of values and norms, which are the foundation stones of a healthy, healthy polity. I think the two words that best uh, characterize it, even though those words themselves are, 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 are somewhat abstract, is uh, nihilism, and narcissism. Nihilism, in the sense, refers to a condition, it's really a state of, a, state of affairs in which uh, all institutionalized sort of authority and tradition and the sort of fundamental norms and values of a society cease to exercise their, their, their influence as, in effect, a collective sort of superego on the behavior of, of persons, both at the very top, uh, the people who are our masters, uh, the people who hold the great offices of state. And in fact, I would argue it's, it's visible as well in the, uh, let's say, the abuse of authority by those who hold positions of power and influence uh, 
in all institutions, be they economic, be they uh, financial, whether they be social, one sees it even even in, in, in universities. And as a consequence, I mean, there is no insufficient break or sort of check on persons inclined to act in in a manner that is impelled by by emotion, by dogma, um, by willful ignorance. And I think those are the three traits which characterize sort of not just leadership in the West today, but which characterize the political class as well. And that's what permits this sort of ex- really rather extraordinary and probably singular, unprecedented uh, conformity that you see. It's not just that certain leaders in certain states seem to be disengaged from reality, uh, pursuing, taking actions that are self-contradictory, pursuing policies that are self-defeating. It's not just individual leaders. It indeed is the political elite, and that political elite uh, encompasses uh, officials elected and appointed. It encompasses the mainstream media. It it, it encompasses even the the largest segment of, uh, of academia. And and certainly, if we're speaking of the United States, this sort of constellation of think tanks and and institute, which have such a a prominent influence in shaping uh, the educated public's uh, understanding as to how the world works, uh, what's going on in it, and how how we should address it. Those are ingredients of what I think is is a totally unprecedented phenomenon, which we're going to be struggling to understand. The sad thing is that we don't, while we struggle to understand it, uh, the West is inflicting on itself, you know, wounds that I believe, and I think objectively speaking, are extremely serious, and it's not at all clear uh, how they are going to be uh, dealt with, whether they will ever heal, and whether the the kinds of, of remedial actions necessary to restore them to health are even contemplated, much less applied. Where do you think that comes from? Because I, I, I share this view. I mean, you know, it's, it, I think it's important for us to recognize that we are in the same epistemic bubble. We, ha- we understand what's going on in Ukraine, in Gaza, in the same in the same terms. We have the same underlying analysis, um, you know, good old realism. And I think we both agree with Mearsheimer. We agree with Petra. We agree with others who have who've, who've had who have a certain understanding of what's happening. Now, the other side, the people who do this collective suicide, either, no, they don't share, they don't share that analysis. They don't, they are not in our epistemic bubble. They are in a different epistemic bubble um, because uh, I don't think they lie. When they when they say, certain things are clearly lies, but when they, when they say things like, you know, we must not let Russia win and we must, uh, we must stand with Ukraine and, you know, especially the, 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 the empty stuff the stand with Ukraine or the, uh, right of self-defense of Israel and so on. These are empty, empty shells. Mm. Um, but they throw that out. And I do, but I do think that these people, a lot of the people believe in them. Um, some might be lying. Others, others have swallowed the pill whole. Um, how's that? How do you think that happened? Because I do remember I, there was a time I've read about the time when Western Europe was more pragmatic and realist, you know, when the Germans did Ostpolitik and tried to get along with the Russians, when when world leaders were actually engaging in the Oslo process in order to get to a two state solution. And, you know, when and that seems this seems to be gone. So how did how did we get here? Well, I think we must begin by looking at the United States, because it's been some time in which the major and certainly the the minor or sort of smaller countries of Europe have exercised, uh, you know, their full sovereignty 
in thinking through sort of soberly where the national interests lie, whether they align completely with the self-defined national interests of the United States, and whether they accept res responsibility for uh, at times deviating from the American view, and uh, therefore are prepared to accept an element of contention in transatlantic or, or, or bilateral U.S. some you know country X in Europe uh, uh, relations. I mean, the truth is that after 70, 75 or what we seventy nine years after the end of end of World War Two, we are still, I think, living temperamentally and emotionally in the post war era. Insofar, Europe is unnaturally uh, dependent on the United States, not as much, frankly, for its security and defense, because objectively speaking, there is no manifest really sort of threat to Europe. All this talk of uh, Putin wanting to wash his boots in the English channel is, is pure nonsense. It's confected, right? And there's not an iota of evidence to, to substantiate it. But rather, I think we have to look at it in, in, in psychological terms. It's the classic dependency relationship uh, in which the United States is the sort of superior sort of party and the Europeans are the subordinate and willingly subordinate, which spares them the, the need, the responsibility, the pain to sort of think through these matters of consequence and to conduct uh, you know, their own external relations diplomacy with with the world. Uh, the, the fascinating question is why this psychology of dominance and subordination is has remained so pervasive, right? Uh, long past the time when events uh, constructed it or allowed it. To, to develop. And so Europe has become, as I mean, far as the international stage is concerned, they've become politically denatured. Uh, I'm not, I follow English, British, French affairs less, less conscientiously, uh, other continental European affairs, but this is self evident. It has been so evident for quite some time. Uh, so I think to in order to understand this sort of conformity and uniformity of outlook and an outlook which is disengaged from objective reality, uh, you know, having covering not only the United manifest not only in the United States, but throughout the West, you have to note this dependency relation, this dominant subordinate relationship. And therefore you look at what's happened in the United States, which is the dominant part of which shapes thinking and even and emotions, you know, across uh, across the West. So we're the source of this, in a way. And uh, let me just sort of brief, very briefly note, I think, the currents uh, that, that have come together. Uh, let's not go too far back in history. Let's just go back to 1991. One often speaks about American triumphalism. Well, yes, that's true, but there were no great public celebrations. There were no victory parades. What the collapse of the Soviet Union did was simply to confirm in, a, in the collective American subconscious the notion that the U.S. is a, a privileged society, a country, placed on Earth, whether by history or by providence to lead the world towards a, a more enlightened, better future. In other words, we were born in a condition of original, original virtue. And the messianic, the belief in messianism, right? That this is that this is the way to do it and everybody needs, we just need to spread the good word of it. Well, I mean, there are two, two versions of this or two lines of, of dealing with the world that uh, can tended with each other, or at least did through much of our history. And that's, that turns on the question of whether the United States fills its destiny as model or as agent. 
And this was a great debate throughout the 19th century. And, and there were those who, who uh, commented on it quite directly, like John Quincy Adams, who wrote a, a famous passage, these are remarks, that with the well wishes of, you know, to the forces of good in the world, but we were not there to pick up arms and support. And of course, yeah, we won't, is, America won't search, uh, what was it? America won't go in search of its of monsters abroad? Yes, very good. I've forgotten the exact words. Right. That began to change as the United States, one, grew stronger. Mm -hmm. In the dominant industrial power went early in, in, the, in the 19th century. Of course, the, the first signs were, well, the manifest destiny is one of the uh, one of the consequences or one of the manifestations of this attitude. Manifest destiny referred to the idea which was almost universally accepted going back to the even the first half of the 19th century, the United States was destined to uh, cover the ent entire territory of North America, or at least south of, of Canada, between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And that's what drove the expansion. That's what drove the uh, 1848 war with Mexico, which was a classic war of, um, of imperialism. And, and seizing all of these vast territories, which were legitimately and, and legally Mexican. Uh, in the 20th century, this tension between those who wanted the U.S. to be Asian and those who want the United States to restrict its role to being model for the world I took a somewhat different form. It was a debate between the internationalists and the isolationists, which was settled by World War II. We're no isolationists after World War II, and there are no isolationists now, despite a rather promiscuous sort of use of, of the term. So I guess first point is, 1991 strengthened and confirmed this belief, which is rooted in the American consciousness, both individually individuals and, of course, then, then, then collectively. Two, primarily, the second act was the uh, notion, which now has become almost universally accepted among political elites, that the United States had a unique historical opportunity to shape the world in its own image after 1991. And this uh, represented a convergence of both classic American idealism and those who thought in idealistic terms, because now it can shape the world on our image, which meant liberty, democracy, all kinds of good things. And those sort of hard-headed power, political-minded realists, like Paul Wolfowitz, who saw this an opportunity to, to establish and to maintain and to prevent any challenge to American hegemony. It all laid out in his famous memo of March, whatever, 8th, 10th, uh, 1991. And anyone who wants to understand American thinking about the world today and its place in it and what its objectives should be, you should go back to that memo. Because now... The idealistic and the, the hegemonic imperialist strands uh, are, are abraded. They're intertwined. They're no more pure idealists. And the shift has been very much in the direction of what Wolfowitz wanted to do. And one of his famous uh, and extremely important and influential admonitions was the United States, well, let me see just two of them. One, the United States must prevent the emergence of any other power that can challenge who might be in a position to challenge American dominance. And the United States should marshal and, and deploy all of the assets, all of the instruments of power and influence at its disposal to ensuring that such an unwelcome development 
never occurs. And of course, you see that now manifest in U.S. foreign policy today, right? It's it's what Henry Sachs calls full spectrum full spectrum dominance. That uh, this, the neocons in military terms, but there's been full spectrum dominance in every region of the world. And that provided the the stimulus for the United States building up this sort of galaxy of bases everywhere, which has continued. We have bases now in in one form or another. I know the latest count is 82, sort of 109 countries, and a compulsion to build them, to maintain them, and try and exercise influence. And just one other sort of quick elaboration on, on, on the first point, this, uh, the willful which admonition is what drives the current hostility to, toward China, toward Russia, towards Iran, and towards all kinds of minor players, everyone from, from Venezuela, and Nicaragua and and Cuba to Syria uh, to to pre-revolution uh, Libya, etc. And this sort of aggressiveness has become the the characteristic trait, the signature trait of American foreign re- foreign relations. And that's what what's driving on it. And there, so with go ahead, please. There, there, thank you. The, you know, there is this um there's a tendency to ascribe militarism and 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 the the the, the expand the expansion of the empire and so on to the military industrial complex or to the media or to certain politicians. But the interesting thing is that it is all of these things combined that then, of course, find an umbrella in this messianic uh, way of thinking, right? Which then is, which often is then defended um, by some politicians, etc., and then that that plays into the entire the entire system. What you're pointing out and that you're using the term idealism is quite interesting. And next week, I'm going to interview two, two scholars who, who wrote a really great piece about George Washington, who was, you know, today they, he would be called an isolationist. Uh, at the time, of course, he was the one, he was the, the U.S. statesman who who tried to constrain Jefferson in saying like, dude, <laughs> we're not we're not trying to venture into these European affairs. Let these idiots kill themselves. We're going to do on our continent what we need to do. And there, there was right. always this 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 tendency. It's what you just described between the idealists who want to who want to mm-hmm. latch on to a to a greater narrative about what humanity should be, and then push that out, and the, those who want to constrain it. And just one more thing. The, these people would never have described themselves as isolationists, never, even before the Second World War. They always described themselves as neutralists or neutral, those who want to, the U.S. to be to be neutral. The term isolationist is itself an invention of the post-Second World War period to, to, to right. smear these people. Um, there's a beautiful essay, about uh, a beautiful uh, um, uh, histor- um, historical piece about this by, by, by a great, um, I forgot her name, a historian, I think from Boston, um, you know how this is post facto then then ascribed to them. But this tendency seems to be there. And this tandem, even the restrainers, they were never against, you know, war with the with the native tribes. Well, Washington was very much in favor of that and building the nation based upon a strong army. Um, so and it seems to, to me that the US, these two forces, they go hand in hand and then they build actually what you're seeing now um well, the ideal is i mean you're, you're absolutely right and that divergence first uh surfaced at the time of the french revolution yes yes yeah. like jefferson whom you cite you know was very sympathetic to it and he wanted the u.s to back in those days that simply meant rhetorically and, and politically uh, the, you know, the revolutionary forces. And of course, there was a certain amount of posturing about that. 
In a way, if you want to draw a very rough comparison, uh, Jefferson was the, you know, the, the Emmanuel Macron of his time. <laughs> Not very flattering to Jefferson. <laughs> no, but flattering probably to Macron, since Jefferson did have some very great accomplishments to his credit, which Macron clearly has none. But it's sort of posturing, you know, demonstrating that you really in the right, and you know what's true and you know what's virtuous, et, 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 et cetera. But this kind of idealism sort of continue right through, and it's, let's think of it in terms of the last decade or the last, well, post 9-11 era, mm -hmm. right? Um, the 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 move or the movement for the United States to some, uh, scour the globe looking for evildoers or potential evildoers, accompanied by the auxiliary belief and, and purpose that uh, the United States uh, had to take action to remove anyone who was sympathetic to a facilitator of terrorism, or frankly, anybody who got in our way. Uh, that too combined realism and idealism. Remember the something, a slogan, or, or, or sort of logo, which was very popular until a few years ago, called um, the, the right to protect. Yeah. Mm. R2P. RPT, right. And that came, in, that came in the wake of the Bosnian particularly disaster and the Rwandan affair. And this tap, deep-seated American idealism. And we had to intervene on humanitarian grounds. You know, what's happened over the ensuing, whatever, 15, 18, 20, 22 years, is that this humanitarian principle or impulse ideal has been weaponized. Of course, yeah. And use it selectively to denounce countries we don't like in power political terms, and we don't use it or apply it in those situations where the, the perpetrator is somebody we consider an ally or a friend, as Israel and Gaza, the ultimate case. But the cases like that, numerous case, cases like that. The personification of this is, is this uh, woman who is now head of USAID uh, powers. Yeah. Um, and she she became in effect the the inspiration for this R two P movement after Bosnia, and she's the one who wrote the book, deifying in effect uh, what was his name the Brazilian uh, diplomat uh, who peacemaker mediator who was blown up in a bombing in Baghdad, Demello, mm. right. And then she became UN ambassador over, under Obama. And she's reappeared again. And as a UN ambassador, she defended every odious American ally like that and concentrated on, you know, attacking with vehemence uh, the Chinese because of what goes on in, in, in Xinjiang province, et cetera, et, et cetera. So, Genuine idealism, which has been a very, as you, you, you just said, a very strong current in American thinking and American self-image and, and, and so forth, uh, has been absorbed and, 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 and become just a support for what is a very straightforward and, 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 and onerous uh, foreign policy of domination. That, that's 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 where we are now. And it's, well, why don't we just leave it there? And... The interesting thing to me is that a lot of the Europeans like that. 
they like that in the, in the elites. I mean, this is the, the satellites are now so tightly integrated that, you know, they they don't only go along because they have to. It's not because there's a gun pointed at them. It's because a good part of the elite has swallowed the pill whole. It was so interesting. Yesterday, I had a discussion with a Swiss historian. The guy hates my guts or he hates my opinions uh, very much. So he, he also, he, he doesn't belong to our epistemic bubble. He very much belongs to the other one. And um, the... When I, you know, when 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 I point out all of these contradictions in the in the general narrative, like okay, on the one hand, great humanitarian, great humanitarian force, like uh, uh, R2P and and everything for humanity, and we have to protect the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and so on, but then you have this problem that forever uh, there was complete support by the U.S. and the Europeans for Saudi Arabia, a regime that every year like literally beheads dozens of people right and then the reply to that is look just because we cannot we are not able to stop certain uh wrongdoers that doesn't mean that we shouldn't shouldn't oppose the wrongdoing and the evil doing of those who we can oppose kind of accepting that there are geopolitical realities okay for which we cannot cannot use our principles on on one set of states but that we very much should weaponize them on 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 those who are we, who who we don't want to be friendly with this is this was fascinating to me and it, it's because they need to square this problem right and this hypocrisy and this is why you pointed out you know the moral defeat Right. I mean, Saudi Arabia could still be ignored, like what and and the and the other kind of support for for autocratic and 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 outspoken uh, like dictatorial regimes, those could still be ignored. But what we cannot ignore anymore, the world can't ignore Gaza. Right. Gaza lays it all bare. It's like all open for everybody to see that the whole show about human rights, even though mm -hmm. some people very much believe in them, and I do think human rights are a great idea, and we shouldn't get rid of them at all. They are a good idea, but they have been weaponized. To the point where they are just another instrument in the toolbox of hegemony. That, unfortunately, is absolutely correct. And that's the great tragedy of the West. Right? It's a tragedy which is not just a, a well, is it a moral tragedy? It's having profound practical mm -hmm. consequences. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the original initial formulation of, you quoted or cited a sort of Swiss historian, not entirely unreasonable. I mean, you could say that there are situations in which you can intervene one way or another uh, to prevent, you know, diabolical things from occurring. And there are other instances which you cannot. That's common sense. Mm -hmm. right. But the underlying hypocrisy, which has always been there, whether acknowledged or acknowledged to oneself or, or, or not, uh, that's of the past. I mean, Gaza is the ultimate stress test. You know, it's like a... a you take a, a, a picture, an x-ray of the body as the fluid passes through it and the fluid highlights the actual state of, and functioning of vital organs. And Gaza is a stress test. And what it's shown is a West that is racist, however you want to define the term. The point is what was occurring to the Gazans occurred to you was inflicted on any Europeans, you wouldn't get this, not this blase response, but this complicity. We are, in legal terms, you know, accomplices before, during the fact. And as they say, you know, John. Uh, and that has to be understood in part in terms of racism. Of course, the the, the the emotions associated with everything that concerns Jews is gives this situation a unique flavor. And you know, I wrote a piece back mm. last year with we regard to this. Also on my homepage, you can find it there. I'll link it. Oh, great! 
And it inflicts the U.S. and and in Europe in somewhat different ways. Uh, But in the United States, there aren't latent feelings of guilt for historical persecution of of Jews leading to the ultimate, uh, you know, sin of, of, of the Holocaust, right? Um, but the United States, what you have is the enormous political power exercised by the Israeli lobby. Uh, and it's that too has been exposed to the, you know, in its full extent. Uh, and it's exercised uh, as well, mainly in, as far as the government's concerned, in donations, campaign donations. Um, you know, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars in support candidates, and you, it turns out, well, you can you can buy a U.S. congressman at a really quite reasonable price, and you can buy a U.S. sort of senator for, you know, that price plus a certain, you know, supplement. Of course, since senators have to run for re-election every six years rather than two years as to members of the House of Representatives, right? Yeah, the donations have to be a bit bigger. You don't have to make them that often. I'm the same. Uh, and then the influence spreads as well into, into the media. But let's not go too far into that. But, I mean, what there is no defense for Western complicity in Gaza. There is no justification there is no rationalization. It's a blunt, compelling truth. And two thirds of the world sees it exactly like that. And part of the, you know, the conceit of the West, which is associated with a history of colonialism, colonialism which itself is associated with with racism of one kind or another, or racist attitude. You know, the rest of the world doesn't count. But the rest of the world now is not the rest of the world that it was 40 or 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, China China has the world's largest economy, right? The the members of BRICS alone constitute uh, what, 60, 65% of humanity, remember? and you'd be hard-pressed to find, any, well, not anyone, you can never say that, but any significant slice of population in China, in Russia, a few in India, in Indonesia, right? in most of South America, in Brazil, who share the Western perspective on Gaza. And in fact, most of them don't even share the Western perspective on on Ukraine. The interest, you're absolutely right. And I just was in Southeast Asia and Thailand, Indonesia, you speak to anyone you want, they don't share the perspective. The interesting thing is that of course, the Europeans and the Americans, they, I mean, even the Japanese, even in Japan, like the, these 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 uh, wars are, they are understood more in the sense of how they are portrayed in the West, but not quite. I mean, there's this way more nuanced to TV, the TV stations here, way more. They try to explain way more of where it comes from than try to to create a, a single narrative, which is what we are having this this unspeakable propaganda that that is that is like just like a deluge. Like sweeping over us, the the thing is that the Europeans for the last five six hundred years, they have always taken for granted that their current narrative and their current like mm. explanation of the world is the explanation, and that everybody else who doesn't understand it just hasn't hasn't learned enough yet is is too far behind, just needs to catch up in order to understand the, the benign benevolence of, you know, of how beautiful Christianity is. You all have to swallow it whole, how good the, our 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 wonderful values are. Every single generation in from Europe, what time and again, and they've been able to for 500 years or 600 years to shove it down the throats of everybody else with pure might with the gun and 
the ones that they didn't want to shove it down, they even like we got rid of them, right? The Europeans, they 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 vac vacated three continents of their original populations, three over the last five hundred years. Um, currently, what's happening to the to the to the Palestinians is probably the last kind of outgrowth of this, the last attempt at, at achieving a similar outcome. And now this is not going to work anymore. This is a mm -hmm. real, genuine change in the way that world politics functions be for the first time in five or six hundred years. The white Europeans and Americans, you know, I mean, that's why we belong together, right? It's like, right, right. because they are immigrated Europeans. Ain't going to work anymore. I really wonder what that if we can avoid a third world war um, based based on the fact that this is a, a fundamental change. Mm. Well, that's uh, you're absolutely right, and you stated it, you know, with concision and very art articulately. I think this is an inch, this is a case in which the word existential threat doesn't apply. I mean, the threat is not that Russia is going to, you know, roll over Europe right, right up to right up to Calais and absorb all of those illegal immigrants that so trouble people on in the Pas de Calais. It's not that China poses any military threat to the United States or any of its its allies, right? Uh, it's not that Venezuela poses a threat of any kind uh, to consequential American interests in the Western Hemisphere. You know? uh, just, you know, looking at, 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 at... It's rather that the very fact that they have grown, developed, strengthened and have their own autonomous view of the world and how it works and worst of all their own ideas as to how uh, polity should be organized right? it is not just anathema unless in some sort of into the west in intellectual terms it seems to be somehow run it somehow runs against the nature of the grain of nature, right? And we're seemingly unable to cont contend with it, with that. So essentially we had, you know, when you think about, about China in particular, and China really unsettles certainly American elites uh, more than Russia does, although the anti-Russian hysteria and mania it's very hard to explain. You try out one hypothesis after another, it, it, it and it doesn't 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 work. I think with Russians, in effect, have been made designated by the West have been designated wogs in the British term, worthy or gentle Oriental gentlemen. They're disparaging to term to all non-Europeans, and therefore. You can, uh, they constitute, therefore, a threat above and beyond anything that's tangible. And you can abuse them verbally, uh, and you can justify trying to isolate them, as we've done since 1991. Russia here I'm talking about, not, not the Soviet Union, because they're not us. You deny them the, the status as Europeans, we treat them as wogs. And if you look at the, the venom and the vehemence, uh, which is directed, for example, at Vladimir Putin, whatever you think of him, you can disagree and criticize everything he's done. He's not at all the cartoonish person that he's depicted, in, not only in the mass media, but, but by American and European heads of state. Yeah. It's the utter absurdity. You know, Hillary Clinton calls him Hitler. Yeah, but because you need him to be Hitler, you need him to be absolute evil in order to justify throwing everything at him. Everything, right? 
bite. So yeah, you need him to be absolute evil. This is part of the of the of the vilification of the of the other one. Even I mean, he deserves he deserves blame on certain parts. But yeah, he's a he's he's being cartoonishly blamed for everything, and this is this is ridiculous. It's just you place him in the same box in the same emotional box, right? Yeah, and and, and Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, and even Idi Amin. You know, they're all the wrong kinds of people. The thing is, that what this does is, of course, that if if Putin is Hitler, then the only solution is to go to Berlin or go to Moscow and bomb him out of the Führer bunker, right? It's, well, that's that's the sad thing that this that this rhetoric does. Um, and of course, well, like for the Führer, it wasn't the Americans who bombed him out of the bunker. It was actually the Soviets, that's, right? That's, yeah. what, that's what, you know, Victoria Newland, right? That's what, uh, you know, former Prime Minister Johnson, Boris Johnson, this is what Madame Baerbock, Baerbock in Germany, right? Uh, this is what they would like to do, and all these odd people in in the Baltics, you know, who and this is what is what they did with with Hussein, right? I mean, uh, Hillary Clinton is on the record how she said, "We came, saw he died," or was it about yeah. Gaddafi? About uh, about it was Gaddafi? It was it Gaddafi? Yeah, that, that... She was laughing. She's like, "Oh, oh, oh. Like, you despicable oh. person." Let me just, I know we have to wrap this up, battery committing or not. <laughs> Let me make other one, one broader point, which is faced with the rise of the non-West, which is China, a main, but not just China. It's India, about which there's a lot of ambivalent thinking in, in, in the West. And India itself is ambivalent <laughs> as to whom it identifies you know, Indonesia, <laughs> we, had, we had a choice. And the choice was to consider them hostile potential rivals to be suppressed one way or another. I mean, we can, you know, uh, you know, think of various ways and what it means to suppress, but we all know, you know, the Wolfowitz approach. The other was to recognize that this was now a given on the international system. For the United States, the, the period of, of American hegemony post-1991 is over for objective reasons. And you have to work out through sustained, skillful diplomacy, terms of not just coexistence, right, but terms of engagement with them. And so and a lot of international institutions have to be modified. And arrangements have to be adjusted. Understandings have to be reached through a sustained you know, process of, of, of diplomacy. And you have to set, you know, agree on rules of the road. And I don't think that would have been at all impossible because neither Russia nor China is inherently hostile or antagonistic to the West per se. Neither one seeks world, dom you know, world domination. And I think a truly far-sighted and American, and it would have to be the American American president, right, would begin this process. And in effect, the foundation stone would be a benign concert, not like the concert of Vienna intended to suppress and to provide mutual support in the event of any social political revolution, but simply a meeting together informally to develop a common understanding as to what the, the, the today's structure of the world is, and how to how to operate within it, how to conduct oneself within it, and you know this would be like the the, the soft core 
of a much wider concert that would involve all of the major nations, you know, Europe, uh, Japan, Brazil, Indonesia, certainly, you know, India, right? Uh, and there was, I think there was an opportunity to do it, not just for the negative reason that neither of the two major non-Western, Russia or China, harbors ambitions to rule the world, but think of you have leaders in Putin and Xi, uniquely qualified by temperament and intellect and outlook to engage in this process. Yeah. They also exercise political control over their own countries to an exceptional degree. Yeah, they weren't going to dis I'm talking about 10 years ago. They weren't going to disappear right? or, you know, over overnight. Right? So they had both dominance in their own countries, using that term in its neutral sense, right? Uh, they were able to cut deals. They would have been able to cut deals. Right? Very few constraints internally, although, you know, some. Mm -hmm. And they had longevity, because this is not something you just put down on a piece of paper, sign it, and it implements itself. And we lost that opportunity, which was, a, to my mind, a unique and distinct historical opportunity, which fortunately opened to us at a great historical juncture, historic juncture in, in the life of the planet. There is nobody among America, well, last session, and nobody among American foreign policy elites who ever thought in these terms. And there is nobody even today, well, there are a handful of, of very exceptional and distinguished people, some of whom you know and have had on your, your channel, who recognize it, but nobody who is currently active neither in terms of the position or office they hold, nor in terms of their the public prominence. There's not a single one. And I don't believe there's any noteworthy figure like that in, in Europe uh, either. I have talked to too many and studied about too many great American diplomats, especially diplomats of the State Department and and intellectuals, to believe that there will not be another one and, and a group come up again. They will, they will come back. And we have a history of actually also managing to do what you just described, to then use a juncture. We had 1975, the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, 50 states, including the Soviet Union, inclu including America, the United States, signing an agreement, a common understanding of how to create common security. We can pull off the same again on a global level, uh, Conference for Security and Cooperation, on the, in the, a global Conference for Security and Cooperation. We can hammer it out. We just have to hope that the people will emerge who's, who see it like this also in the West. And it's a beautiful way to end, actually. So I, I thank wish you. I, shared your, I wish I shared your optimism. I don't for two reasons. One, I look at who our next, which of our sort of two contenders will be the next president of the United States. And two, I live in Texas. <laughs> Go and shoot the guns. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much for your time. Thanks again for the opportunity to, to talk with you and to talk to whenever... Um, audience sort of clicks in the right place. <laughs> we will talk again. Thank you, Michael.